Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to try and get through most of, uh, well, I, I want to complete chapter one today with the hopes of at least beginning chapter two. Definitely won't finish it. As always, make sure that you're up to speed in the reading um, to allow the lecture to make a lot more sense. It'll be easier to follow. Um, and then one of the things in particular to make note of is how things that we're going to talk about in this chapter um, will help you understand things in chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. Um, so we are talking about, again, our correction system in America and how it uh, derived from Europe originally, the Roman law and some of the things that were going there. We get to a more, uh, for lack of a better term, civilized aspect of criminal justice where we're aiming to not just punish people um, as harshly as possible, but in a way that's actually going to allow them to um, get better, to reform. That we don't believe that people are just naturally born criminals or evil people, that we can create a system that corrects their behavior. So the classical school was one of the first introductions of a new approach to criminal justice. I'm sorry, a new approach to corrections, a new approach to corrections. We're going to talk, so we're in the 1700s, 1800s America now. There have been many phases up through this very moment of how we have tried to uh, run our correctional facilities and what the purpose of uh, this, these uh, systems are, the purpose of these facilities are. So this, to have a criminal justice system and a correction system that organ, uh, was ran this way, it required us uh, accepting certain principles about human behavior. Again, if we're going to correct human behavior, we need to understand uh, what's the goal and what's the best way of doing that. The first is that people act to increase their pleasure and reduce their pain in any situation. That if you that people don't commit crimes just because they're bad people. If you can steal all the jelly beans, uh, people like jelly beans. If they can get a whole bunch of jelly beans without having to pay for them, they're going to do it. And if there's more benefits for them taking those jelly beans than negative outcomes, they're going to continue that behavior. We have to eventually introduce the notion that it's more negative consequences for you in doing this behavior. So this is where, again, people just weigh the pros and cons of the decision. So it's working off the premise that people weigh the pros and cons of the decision. Does this choice give me more pleasure or pain? However, the punishment should be painful enough to deter criminals. This was a topic we talked about on our first couple of days of class, that one of the main goals of punishment is to deter other people, as well as the individuals themselves. So you want to deter the person for their behavior, for you to see that um, as much as you may like jelly beans, if you take jelly beans that don't belong to you, there are going to be negative consequences, and those negative consequences outweigh the benefits. But it's also important that we do this in a way to show to other people. But something that was really unique about the classical school that was different from other times is that this notion that the punishment should fit the crime. The notion that the punishment should fit the crime. Under the old school way of thinking, um, if you like, you know, uh, again, we talked about the code of uh, Hammurabi. And under that model, if you stole anything, your hand could be chopped off. Clearly, we know today that it's a little bit different than like if you steal jelly beans and if you steal somebody's car, if you steal somebody's pension fund. So the same way, again, we've all been punished in our whole households as children. But there's a difference between getting punished for like, you know, uh, hitting your sister as opposed to not eating your vegetables. There's a different levels of punishment for um, you know, get into a fight at school as opposed to uh, you know coming in five minutes after curfew. Again, the, in that model, the goal of the parents is not to make you feel uh, pain. The goal is to correct behavior. The goal is to correct behavior. The goal is to correct behavior. So if you punish too harshly, again, think about this as a, as a child. If you punish a child too harshly, it's probably not going to necessarily correct their behavior it's going to lead to worse behavior. It's going to lead to resentment. It's going to lead to like people questioning the legitimacy of the punishment in the first place. That mama's not just punishing, punishing me to, uh, so I can learn a lesson. She's punished me because she's mad. 
or to pay me back for something. The classical school philosophers did not believe that that was a very healthy way of trying to correct behavior. So this is where we began to like, you know, have, we really began to consider uh, the length of sentences and the type of punishments that we should have. As opposed to just punishing everybody we got, that if you violate the law, you're going to get drawn and quartered. I mean, I guess we could do that, but if our goal is to actually correct behavior, that's probably not going to be the most successful strategy. We also want to make sure that equal justice was applied to everyone. That it shouldn't just be a situation where if you were powerful, if you knew the right people, that you would get away with, so like, you know, again, uh, certain criminal behavior. That the punishment again should that if anybody commits murder, if anybody steals a loaf of bread, this is what should happen to everybody, no matter what their uh, position is. Then finally, the law should be applied to people uh, solely for again their behavior, not for what they did, uh, for what they might do, for what they believe. This is really important. Again, in earlier times, like people would be uh, in prison if they didn't believe in the quote unquote right God. If they didn't believe that like, uh, if you're a woman who believes that like uh, women and men were equal, if you believe that um, the earth revolved around the sun, like these are all beliefs that you could be killed for. So again, the notion here, right, is that we're trying to think of a different approach to uh, the correction system. So this first philosophy is called a classical school. Without looking at, uh, with limited use of your notes, can anybody summarize this view uh, uh, for me? So what the classical school holds certain things as being true about human beings. What are those things? Summarize for me in your own words, the philosophies of the classical school in terms of how we should operate our correctional facilities. What were the views of the classical school? Um, that punishment should basically fit the crime. Good. Either if you be too strict or too lenient, um, the punishment should be equal. Good. What else? Good. Very good. What are some other components of There are several pillars of this. So making sure that our punishment fits the crime is a very important one. But what are some other components of uh, the classical school thought? Um, you thought about um, creating more um, authoritative um, positions that it would um, st like stop people from um, doing more things. Uh, no. So several, like one of the things that was really important about the classical school is that we had to begin to like make observations about the social world. So again, right, if, if we're locking people up, what, what, do you, what again, what do you all think should be our goal of locking people up? What are we trying to achieve with that as a, as a society? If we're putting people in jail, what are we trying to achieve with this very costly enterprise? Basically teach a lesson? Uh, nope. Well, but the same What'd you say, Mr. Muhammad? Uh, so what is our goal with the correction system in locking people up at a considerable cost to you, the taxpayer? What are we trying to accomplish with that? Some of it is teaching a lesson, but, it, but less than that. Somewhat. But what do you think? What do you think our goal? Let me ask it a different way. If you ran the prisons, what do you think the goal should be? You said if I ran, if we ran the prison? Yep. That if you're locking all these people up, what do you what are you aiming to accomplish here? Trying to keep the criminals off the street. Good. So one goal, keep that in mind. One goal is to keep people that if somebody is a danger danger to all of us, Nigeria, we want to keep them away from us. If Dylan Roof can potentially do this again, we want to make sure that he's locked up so he can't do that anymore. Very good. What are some other th reasons why we might uh what are, what are some other things we might want to accomplish? So one is just keeping the dangerous people away from all of us. What might be another goal? Setting on um, boundaries. To, to protect the city? That's related to um, Nigeria's, uh, uh, the point before, that again, we're gonna protect the city by making sure that the dangerous people are kept away. 
So that's one thing that we're accomplishing. What are some other things we can accomplish with this? Bring the crown right down. No wrong answers here. What are some other things we can accomplish? So one of the things we talked about, right, we, we want to make sure that people are not, uh, that a Dylan Roof is not free to harm other people. But another thing that we want to do is for other people to see what happened to Dylan Roof. And if they're thinking about killing somebody, we want the public to see what can happen to them as well. So we also, it's also to the church. Um, the notes again, like, and I know that at times there's a consternation about coming to class and stuff like that. Class time is only useful if you're like really actively engaged. So when we're going through this stuff, if y'all are not understanding the, the concepts, I need you all to stop me and slow me down so that we can go over them. Because if I'm moving on, I'm doing it under the assumption that we understand this stuff. I think these things are pretty easy to understand, quite frankly. You just gotta like, you know, um, much like again, if you're not gonna uh, get more muscles by going to, just by going to the gym, you actually gotta lift weights. You gotta lift some weights in here with me sometimes too. So the example I gave in terms of like, if you see your older sibling being punished, the goal there is not just to bring pain to the, uh, to the older sibling. The goal is not just to bring pain to Dylan Roof, but also so other people can see what may happen to them. So we wanna deter future crimes by people knowing that you may be punished. That again, if you're going down, whether it's something like murder or you're driving down the highway and you see somebody being pulled over, that can that's not just done again to deter uh, that person, but it's for other people as well to see. Slow down. So a large part of our correction system is also so other people can see. Like one of the reasons, for example, why we have it so public is so everybody can see hey, this is the sentence you get if you could, if you help have a concealed weapon. This is the sentence you get if you commit a DUI. This is the sentence you get if, um, if you cheat on your taxes. This is the sentence you get if you um, go 20 miles over the speed limit. So we want to, so there are many different crimes, right? So we also want to make sure, they also want to make sure, as you talked about, Savannah, that the, um, the punishment fits the crime. That again, if if you stole something back in you know uh, Roman law under Roman law or the code of uh, Hammurabi, you could have your hand chopped off no matter no uh, uh, what the conditions or explanation you have for stealing. But as our society is becoming more advanced, Savannah, we're, we begin to think like, okay, look, maybe some people do need to have their hands chopped off, you know, for stealing. But should we chop off everybody's hand? And what are we trying to accomplish in chopping off their hand? Are we trying to teach them a lesson? Are we trying to deter other people? Are we just trying to like, you know, punish them as harshly as possible? Again, like I talked about with a parent, the goal of punishment is not just to make you feel bad, it is to try and change behavior. So the main, of, the main point of corrections is, is of course, um, and there are four main goals of the criminal justice system in general. Savannah, as you take notes, don't only write down what's on the screen. The most important things, a lot of times, is what's being communicated by me and your classmates. There are four major goals of the criminal justice system, period. And one of them is under the understanding that for all the Dylan Roofs of the world who um, hopefully will never see the light of day again, most people are actually going to return to society. If we locked all these people up, and they're not getting better, what are we doing? So another major goal is to actually rehabilitate these people to make them better. Um, again, if you read chapter one, all of this should be really clear by now. And we should be reviewing Savannah as opposed to learning this stuff for the first time. If you're engaging this material for the first time during class, you're probably not gonna learn very much. If you're engaged in this material for the first time during class, you're probably not gonna learn very much. If you're engaged in this material for the first time during class, you're probably not gonna learn very much. You have to read outside of classes. And then after we uh, go through all these notes, which I know you all are always eager to get, you need to look at them. If there are things you don't understand, let's have a conversation during office hours to get a little bit more clarity. So 
again, right, if we're if we're putting all these people in prison, and as I said before, in 2021, like that's not free. Like we pay our tax dollars to lock people up. Their housing, the people that guard them, the foods they eat, the health services they get, all those things come out come out of our uh, pocket. Much like if you know, if you're sending your kids to school, you you should be able to have some sense that, that they're learning something that they're getting better. We should have some sense that if we're locking all these people up, that it's accomplishing our goals, that the public is actually made safer. That uh, people are um, that people are seeing this punishment, and they're seeing that this crime is being committed less. This concept and this approach to uh, corrections require us uh, implementing this concept of positivism. This is where very quickly you use uh, objective facts to make sense of the world. So if I am saying that my prison is a if I run a prison in the state of uh, South Carolina, and I'm making a case that my prison is doing a good job, based upon the criteria that we talked about before, what are some things I could point to where I can show, you can look at for yourself, you ain't gotta take my word for it, that I can show you that my prison is doing a good effective job. What are some things that I could point to some, to show that? Um, the reform rate of people who get out not coming back. Excellent. The recidivism rate, Malik, should be lower. Recidivism rate, again, is the amount of people that um, get incarcerated and end up going back to jail. Savannah, I believe it was you earlier said that a part of the purpose is for them to learn their lesson. If they're coming to my prison, right, I should be able to demonstrate that they're learning a lesson, that they have learned their lesson from being incarcerated and they're not going to do this anymore. If that's not happening, I might need to ask some questions. Are there any other ways that we might look at the effectiveness of a prison? What are some other ways that we might look at if I'm running a prison that my prison is doing the things that the taxpayers are paying me to do? What are some other ways that we can measure this or look at this? These are the important questions we're having here. And these are the questions where, quite frankly, if you're, if you're a criminal justice major, like these are the kind of questions you need to be thinking about. If you're not thinking about these questions, you run the risk of like, you know, being a black person who maybe memorized a lot of terms is not taking this stuff very seriously. And you get into these legal professions and you don't actually know anything about the law or the rationale behind it. And then you duplicate things that make the law a very uninviting place for black people. It's really important that you understand these things, not that you just try and memorize some concepts and terms and repeat them back on the test. What are some other ways that if I'm running a prison, we could maybe demonstrate that my prison is being run effectively, that I, I'm doing a good job in terms of the things that, you know, the taxpayers are paying me to do? Uh, looking at the things that are done like within the prison, like, um... You know, some um, prisons have like an education program. So you're looking at people, how many of them like attended the program, got out of the program, graduated with it, got to jail, and did something with the actual thing that they learned in jail. Good, very good. So we can look again. I had that 70% of my prisoners, not only do they never come back, but I can show you data that 80% of them have jobs within three years to support their families. What might be another way? They could, a real fundamental way that if, I, if I'm locking people up, what's another thing that I might be able to point to that show that it's working? Again, don't overthink it. If I'm locking people, think of this again for yourself. If you was locked up, how might it impact your behavior? So let's look at this for you know an entire state. If I'm locking a whole bunch of people up, what are some things that I can point to? Like, again, if I'm saying that, you know, I'm educating people here at Allen University, I'm be able to point to like, hey, 70% of like our students have like, you know, made uh, jobs in their majors within four years. 80% of our students went on to graduate programs. Again, like, otherwise, what are we doing? Are we just taking your money? So these are kind of questions y'all need to be asking yourselves. Again, like, um, you know, 
if, if we're putting if we're inputting certain things into these systems, what are we getting out of it? So a final thing that we maybe should see, if I'm locking all these people up, maybe the crime rate should go down, right? That if people see that you know other people are being locked up for similar crimes, one of the goals is we're supposed to deter people from doing these crimes. So maybe so many people saw all these other people being locked up. You saw so many other people locked up for selling drugs that we're gonna see way fewer people selling drugs, right? That would be the logical thing. So positivism is just where we begin to have data and numbers to try and make these conclusions as opposed to just uh, the traditions or superstitions that inform Roman laws, um, for example. Early US punishment again involved repenting. And again, the word penitentiary where people pay a pen, uh, have to pay a penance, where this was off of the notion that people were gonna go into prison they were going to be reformed. They're going to read the Bible. They were going to uh, discipline their behavior. They were going to develop better habits. And as a result of that, they would, you know, uh, come out better people. Again, penitentiary, penitentiary. There were a root word in there is repent. I did a bad thing. I made a mistake. I'm going to go into this institution. I've learned my lesson. By being in this institution, they gave me some habits that are now going to make it where I can behave uh, in a functional way out in society. The earliest pencil, uh, the earliest systems were, uh, were the Western State Penitentiary System and the Eastern State Penitentiary, both in Pennsylvania. And then that made way into like uh, what set the stage for our modern system, the Auburn system here in uh, upstate New York. I'll leave this up for a couple of moments before I begin a dialogue. But keep in mind again, like if if you're not actually listening to and engaging the conversation and absorbing things as they're being communicated, most of these notes are not very helpful. Again, my hope is that you have a strong enough passion for criminal justice that you'll be very interested in reading up on some of these topics. And again, keep in mind that this institution is a product of the classical school approach to corrections, that this prison is an approach to the classical school of correct, the classical school philosophy of corrections. Later, we're going to see other theories and philosophies. So again, here with the classical school, it is a very different approach to how people are being were being punished before. What were some of the examples of how people were being punished back in uh, again uh, Roman times and uh, under uh, the code of uh, Hammurabi? What were some of those uh, examples of punishment again? Uh, Brandon, get the hand chopped off. Any others? Was uh, it like time? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Savannah. Like the horses, you know. I, I didn't hear you, Savannah. I'm sorry. I said, was it when they like tied them up and like I guess got hope? Can, good. You, can you hear me now? Yes. Very good. So they would draw and quarter them. They would boil 
uh, throw uh, boiling hot water on people. That's some really barbaric things. They weren't sure that, again, that this was really going to help people be reformed. There was an interest in wanting people to, you know, become better, and there was a belief again that before then they 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 would do those kind of things to Vanna because it was believed that you're possessed by evil spirits, so you just have an evil spirit yourself, and there's probably nothing that can be done to correct your behavior. As humans advance and evolve, we shot away from those beliefs. We believed that no, people could be born in one station in life. And if we put them in a proper environment, we can improve them. So this proper environment was going to be places like the Auburn system. This is in upstate New York. Inmates in these, uh, in these systems were kept in solitary confinement in the evening. They were allowed to work during the day. And again, look, it is not enough just for you to take these notes and write this stuff down. Somebody in, in second or third grade could do that. Your task, Savannah, is when I ask you about this stuff later on, you act as if you actually wrote it down and understood what you were writing down. Is there anything here that's not clear or that you have questions about? Uh, what is the, the silent system? I don't know what that is. Uh, so where are we at here? That's on, at the bottom of the list. What is that? Oh yeah, so in, in some places, like again, you would like, you know, this you have to stay quiet throughout the day. No talking at all. And again, oh, okay. these are the kind of things where, you know, please, like, I, I can't stress this enough. I'm going to begin uh, getting into chapter two today and even more so on Wednesday. Please take some time to read chapter two and take your own notes. If, if you do that, you like, you'll spend less time taking notes during our lecture. And we can just have a conversation because a lot of this should be reviewed. But it was just a system where, again, people would have to stay completely quiet. It takes a lot of discipline to do these things. All this was this notion of this prison is that people just did not have enough discipline and uh, self guidance. If they had that, so again, the contract labor system, for example, where they were able to develop a work ethic. But the contract labor system is exactly what it sounds like. Corporations would begin to use prisoners, Nigeria, to do work for them. This is in the, the, the for the benefit they were supposed to get, Latasia, is that um, it was supposed to benefit them um, in terms of developing a really strong work ethic. But it also gave a lot of people a lot of free labor. Keep this in mind as we go forward. So many of these prisons can, uh, you know, have factories, but also like, again, within this uh, system elite, they could develop some real skills where they might develop some craftsmanship where they can like uh, build woodworks and things like that in prison. And once they got out, because most of these people were going to be in and out of the penitentiary within a few years. So once they got out, they would have some remarkable skills that they could bring into society. They had lockstep marching, right, left, right, left, right, that type of thing. You may have seen old movies where they be having the black and white striped uniform. So everybody again is coming in the same. And the Auburn system very quickly became a model for maximum security prisons in the 1800s. So over time, because of the way that this prison was constructed, more and more prisons across the United States was constructed in this way. And again, the, the, it was constructed in a way where the goal was to reform you, develop you into some good habits, and return you into society, a contributing member of that society. This continued on through the age of reform. And I'm gonna get through this pretty quickly because I absolutely must get through chapter one today. So, and of course, all of this should be reviewed. So I shouldn't have to spend very much time with this because um, Again, what is this? Uh, we're into February now, right? Through all of February, I, I mean, through all of January, I covered one chapter, Malik, one chapter. If y'all haven't read this chapter by now, give it a whole month, I'm really not sure what to say about that.
So one of the main things came here, right? Our, this, uh, the mark system and indeterminate and determinate sentences. Indeterminate and determinate sentences. Does anybody have any clarity on how those work? Indeterminate and determinate sentences. What are those? Some other aspects of, again, the progressive error was that we begin to, and this is like more, again, we're going very quickly through history. The classical school, uh, we're in the 1820s. The 1870s, we're reforming the classical school. And one of the most important reforms of this period was the uh, indeterminate and determinate sentences. All of this can be found in your textbook with the university uh, paid good money for, you know, to have for free. In the 1960s and 70s, we began to have the progressive era where it began to look at the medical model of uh, prisoner behavior. This looked at the fact that like, you know, that, um, so the, the main notion here, right, is not only that your environment could predict criminal behavior, but your psychology. And in fact, certain environments produce a certain psychology. That no matter where you're from, I'm, uh, I know for sure this is like, so uh, I was talking to my mother today and she's up at arms. She needs to be staying her butt at the crib, but um, there's been a rash of carjackings in Chicago. And one of the things she wondered is the psychology of it, that oftentimes in addition to not only taking your car, after they take your car, they shoot you anyway. These things sound really uh, horrific, and they are. But as opposed to believing that these are, this is just how, like, you know, this group of people behave, or there's something that's in their uh, genetics, or that they've been possessed by the devil, that many of these individuals were uh, reared in environments that produce a certain type of behavior. So with the medical model, Savannah, and this again, like, you know, for uh, my social workers, where ideally, right, so like one of the things that like uh, when, we, when you're hearing police reform over the last year in the wake of George Floyd and other senseless murders, one of the things that's been really addressed is that there are a lot of things that the police are called for that they're not really equipped to deal with. That things that probably psychiatrists or social workers probably need to deal with are being handled by the police oftentimes. So you come like to a scene and like somebody's having a bipolar episode and they're acting crazy. That requires some medical attention. It does not require them to be being handcuffed or shot. Again, what's our goal? What's our goal? Like it, it, this person is bipolar, this person is going through an episode. Our goal should be to make sure the, uh, the public is protected. We can't allow this person to harm somebody else because of their mental health condition. But we also don't wanna like, you know, necessarily harm them for something that, you know, they can't help. Again, that's a chemical issue going on. That would be like, you know, again, like if I have a, a, a convulsion uh, from having a heart attack and I strike out against somebody in the process, then I get shot for that. So the medical model wanted to attack crime. It's like, look, that we can prescribe certain things to solve these crime problems that involve, that go beyond just locking them up. So for example, as opposed to like putting somebody in prison because they're a crack addict, maybe we can give them some medical attention. There was strong pushback against this though in the 1970s. One of the things I want you to make careful note of Nigeria is the political debate. So like all these things we're talking about here is political. I hear people oftentimes say that they're not interested. They don't care much about politics. This is not something I, I would hope that a criminal justice major would ever say because every aspect of the criminal justice system is highly political. We'll look at this in more detail. Here's what I want you to do. I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna log out of this real quick. We're gonna log out of this. I want you to use this very same link because we're gonna get bumped out in a minute. I want you to use this very same link. We're gonna log back onto this lecture at 2.45. By my clock is 2.35. We're gonna log back on and conclude the lecture at 2.45. I'll see you all at that time. If you can take 10 minutes to like look through this chapter a little bit, man, so we can have a little bit more of a coherent discussion. I'll see y'all at 2.45.